Hey there, Matt Hamilton, author of Through Travel and Error, Confessions of an Asylum Seeking Canadian. Welcome back to my online readings. This week is chapter 17 called The Chase. Now, living at Smuggler's Cove in Sinsa was like living in paradise. However, we were also living in rural Africa and there still was an issue of poverty and a massive, massive division of wealth. And during our peak season, there was a little bit of petty theft. Sometimes it was backpacks that were stolen and you know cash was taken. And sometimes it was food stolen from the kitchen. Now, one night when I was working in the bar, right near the clothes, a backpacker came running in and said, hey, somebody was just up in the kitchen. So I ran up the stairs and nobody was there, but the window was open, which dropped down into the bush, which actually happened to attach the bar. So I ran back down around and looked for this guy, but couldn't see him anywhere. And we'll begin the story with me heading back to the bar. The shrub directly behind me rustled. The thief jumped out and sprinted off in the opposite direction, down the dirt path and into the thicker bush. Surprisingly enough, my initial instinct was to run after him, which is exactly what I did. However, initial instincts are sometimes irrational, and I didn't get 20 steps into the darkness before I realized that this was one of those times. It had been my experience that in these moments, especially when that moment is leading me into the darkness, it is best to stop and reconsider whether or not the current move is the wisest. I stopped running. I thought to myself, what the fuck am I doing? Why in God's name was I chasing a thief into the night? I wasn't a security guard, bounty hunter, or Bruce Lee. I was a backpacker working as a barman in a little speck of peaceful paradise with zero training for this type of confrontation. I poured drinks, I played music, I talked to people. I wasn't supposed to be chasing them. How was I going to subdue the thief if I caught up to him? Use the Vulcan death group? Wing Chun Kung Fu? Barrage him with harsh words? I had never thrown a punch in my life, and honestly, I didn't know what I would be capable of doing to detain the burglar. And that was assuming I was even able to catch the guy, which in the darkness would prove next to impossible. The night was so black I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face. As I was contemplating my limited options for apprehension, another notion crossed my mind. What had this thief actually thieved? Some food, nothing more. Part of me was sympathetic to this poor bastard. The hungry soul was not one of those gun-toting criminals. He was stealing bread and butter from wealthy European backpackers in the middle of the night. Was this theft of nutrition really a crime? Was this really a bad guy? I reevaluated the situation. I, an untrained, non-violent Canadian, was running blindly into the African darkness to chase a guy whom I actually felt sorry for. The hungry bastard was on the run and on the defensive. I'm sure that this guy had received his share of beatings over the years and had possibly seen the inside of a jail. If that was the case, then I was positive that he would have no desire to return anytime soon. In fact, due to the violent nature of South Africa, he probably thought that there was a likelihood that I, a white man, would shoot him in the back and then call the cops. This theory meant that the guy would do whatever necessary in order, was whatever was necessary to escape and survive. If he was trapped in a corner, he could hit me on the head, stab me in the back, or worse. I couldn't know for sure how frightened, willing, or capable he was. I did know how frightened, willing, and capable I was. I was terrified, reluctant, and had never been in a fight. What was stopping this petrified guy in the run from using his knowledge of the terrain and the camouflage of the night to get the upper hand on me? The answer was nothing at all. Christ, I'd walked right next to him and hadn't seen him in the darkness. If he needed to take me out, he could easily hide in the bushes and wait for me to walk by. What was stopping him from eliminating me from the chase? Again, the answer was nothing at all. I was decidedly finished with my manhunt. And I was, uh, yeah, I went back and I got the owner and we walked around for a little bit and couldn't find the guy and uh, I went back to my cabin and I sat there for a long time and I was actually quite disturbed by the chain of events. Um, and I said, one of the promises I made myself was if I got unhappy anywhere, I had the freedom to move on. So this is where we'll continue the story, me contemplating whether or not it was time for me to move from, from since then. I kept asking myself the same question. Was it time to leave? Was I unhappy in South Africa? There was no debating that Africa had captivated me. 
I thoroughly relished every chance I had to learn something from my time in this special land. However, there was a massive distinction between experiencing the intricacies of Africa in a car on the way to the crawl and chasing it in the bush. Watching it from a car would, at worst, have me shaking my head. Chasing it into the night could result in me losing my head. Literally. Becoming a victim over a piece of bread wasn't what I had signed up for when I began my travels or work at Smuggler's Cove. Was I risking my life working in this environment? In addition, as much as I loved the bar, I knew that the party lifestyle was slowly taking its toll on my body and brain cell count. It was a party night every night, regardless of the day of the week. The lack of sleep combined with the excessive drinking was a ticking time bomb waiting to explode. I knew that my body could only handle so much abuse before something broke. My major concern was that my tolerance levels of the countless toxins was growing stronger by the day. I could drink like a fish all night and still be sober enough to run the pub. Regardless of my ability to handle the booze, I knew that the copious amounts of alcohol entering my system was doing damage. Part of me, namely my liver, thought that it was maybe time to leave Sinsa. I struggled with my predicament throughout the sleepless night. The thought of what might have happened if I had caught the thief or if he had caught me genuinely disturbed and frightened me. I was not, nor ever wanted to be, a violent person and I was afraid living in South Africa was going to force me into a confrontational situation. I was honestly torn between the two options. I had reached a point where I thought it was time to leave Sinsa. And I did. I really contemplated this for a while, but thankfully the next morning the son of the family came down and we talked and cleared the air about a lot of different things and he really helped me evaluate. However, as we'll continue on, I, uh, I think I'd come to a conclusion before he arrived. However, even before Scott came to the cottage and brought me out of my pensive shell, I knew deep down that I would be staying at Smuggler's Cove for a while. I recognized that there was still much more for me to discover in this crazy yet enchanting country. I had decided that, at the end of the day, the chase was a good thing. The pursuit into the darkness yanked me back into the South African reality. It reminded me that what was happening in the rest of the country wasn't as perfect as it was within the utopian smuggler's bubble. The chase was further evidence that there was still a massive division of wealth in South Africa and that there were many who needed to steal food in order to survive. Crime and the economic inequalities were tragic aspects of the country that I was going to have to accept and address if I wanted to stay in South Africa. If I couldn't handle these problems, my other option was to pack up my three t-shirts and leave. The freedom was mine. Nevertheless, despite the struggles and problems this country faced, I was enthralled and excited about being in South Africa. These dilemmas were part of the battle that this changing nation had to undergo. I was sitting in the middle of a country that was redefining itself. There were positive and negative forces at work in the country's reconstruction. However, despite the frustrations and setbacks, I honestly believe that, over time, the good would prevail over the bad. This country was jam-packed with promise, and I was hoping that South Africa would reach its maximum potential. By staying close to the scene, I could watch how Mandela's vision would unfold over time. I wanted to find out if my belief would prove accurate. There was no question in my mind that traveling was a great lifestyle. It was certainly the best one I had discovered so far in my journey through life. Life as a traveler was certainly more appealing than life as an academic or participant in the 9 to 5 velvet rut. Nonetheless, as with all lifestyles, there were ups and downs. I've come to realize that the secret to happiness is finding a lifestyle where you experience more ups than downs and that the downs, because there will always be bad times, aren't too draining. I believe that I had found that easygoing and enlightening lifestyle in Sinsa. And I did. And uh, as I indicated between those thoughts and Scott's words, I decided to stay and that the chase was uh, an interesting and enlightening experience. I hope you enjoyed uh, this week's segment. Uh, again, it was chapter 17 called The Chase. If you want to find out more about myself or the book, Mad, uh, Through Travel and Air Confessions of an Asylum-Seeking Canadian, please visit my website, madmaddiesworld.com. Until next week, we'll have a good one. Bye.